Hi, everybody. This weekend, I'm beginning our annual fall tour of our campuses, where I intend to visit each of our campuses and see you in person. You know that Saddleback Church is just one church family, uh, but we got so big, we just couldn't fit well, we couldn't fit in Angel Stadium, much less fit in one campus. So we now meet in multiple buildings. And this weekend, I'm starting my tour uh, at Saddleback Irvine North, where Pastor DJ is the pastor. So I'd like for all of us and all of our campuses, when I say three, one, two, three, to wave and say, hello, Irvine North, to all of our brothers and sisters and our Saddleback family at Irvine North. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Hello, Irvine North. <laughs> All right. Now this weekend, I wanna share part five in my series on how God turns setbacks into comebacks. You know, all of us have to deal with many, many different kinds of setbacks in life, financial, health, relational, job setbacks, career setbacks, personal setbacks, spiritual setbacks, many, many other kinds. But today I want us to look at what do you do when a setback leaves you emotionally empty? You know, one of the common negative side effects of setbacks is that they can drain your emotional tank empty so you've got no reserves for dealing with daily life. You know what I'm talking about. You, you just feel empty. You feel like you're running on fumes. You got nothing left to give. You drag yourself through the day. Now, in last week's message, Sheila Walsh referred to Elijah, and this week, I'd like to go back and take a little closer look at the life of this guy named Elijah, because Elijah clearly illustrates for us how God helps us when we're drained emotionally. Now, if you know anything about this man named Elijah in the Bible, you might not expect him to have experienced emotional burnout because God did so many amazing things, so many miracles in and through Elijah's life. And yet the Bible tells us in James 5, 17, quote, Elijah was a man just like us. What does that mean? It means he was susceptible to the same troubles and the same temptations, same moods that we all face every single day. Now, from one particular setback in Elijah's life that we're gonna look at today, God shows us both the warning signs of when you are emotionally empty. You need to know these signs. You need to know the gauges in your own life. And it also, more importantly, gives us the steps that God uses to refill your life with hope and joy and love when you have just hit bottom. Your tank is emotionally empty. Now there's a fascinating story in 1 Kings chapter 19. Uh, but actually, it starts a chapter before in chapter 18. And here's the background. Israel was being led by a very wicked king named Ahab and his wife named Jezebel. You've probably heard of them. The nation had fallen into uh, moral bankruptcy. The, the whole nation had turned away from God to worshiping stone idols, and they were even sacrificing their children. It was a very brutal, bloody uh, uh, religion to, uh, to idols named Baal. There was only one true prophet of God left in the nation. His name was Elijah. And one day, Elijah just gets fed up with all of this idolatry, and he issues a challenge. He goes, how long are you guys, the nation, how long are you gonna waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, and if the idol Baal is God, well, then follow him. And he boldly suggested, let's have a God contest. This is a great idea and he's pretty bold in it. So the entire nation gathers on Mount Carmel in the land of Israel. And Elijah says, okay, here's, here's the plan. We're gonna have a God contest. We're gonna sacrifice two bulls and we'll let the 450 prophets of this false God named Baal, you guys go pray to your idol and then I'll pray to the real God. And here's the key, whoever answers with fire wins the God contest and after that, uh, we will worship and serve whoever God wins. And the people goes, great idea. Well, the prophets of Baal, they go first and they build their, uh, their, their um, wood and they, they put the, the cows uh, on, on the wood and they pray all day and they chant all day and they dance all day and nothing, of course, happens. And of course, Elijah's teasing them the whole day. In fact, he even makes fun of him. He says, is your God asleep? At one point, this is actually in the Bible. He says, maybe your God's going to the bathroom right now. He can't hear you. Maybe you need to shout a little louder. Maybe he's sitting on the toilet. And he makes fun of him. And of course, they fail. That evening, 
Elijah says, okay, let's really, it's my turn, so let's make this a real contest. Here's what I want you to do. I don't, I'm not just gonna call on God to, to, to send down fire, but I want you to soak the wood on my side of my sacrifice with 12 barrels of water so that the wood is actually waterlogged. Okay, we're gonna make it a little tougher for me. And then Elijah prays a very simple prayer. It's in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 36 to 38. It's here on the screen. And it says this, at the time for the evening sacrifice, Elijah went up to the altar and he prayed. It's a very simple prayer. Lord, I know you're the God of Abraham and Isaac and Israel. Now prove that you are the real God and that I am your servant and show these people that you told me to do this. Lord, answer my prayer so these people will know that you're God and that they will change their minds. And it says, out of that simple prayer, he didn't have to pray all day, it's just a couple sentence prayer. Then the fire from the Lord came down and burned up not just the sacrifice and all the wood, but it also burned up the stones and the ground around the altar and it dried up all the water in the ditch. Now the people are astounded, they began to worship God and they rose up and they go, all you other false prophets, uh, uh, you have been leading us astray for years and they got so mad at all the false prophets, they killed them for all their years of deception and the sacrificing of their children that these false prophets had been requiring. And there was a great spiritual revival. But of course, with every mountaintop, there's a valley. And in the next scene, chapter 19 of 1 Kings, uh, uh, Queen uh, Jezebel hears about it and these were her personal false prophets and she gets ticked, she's mad. Now notice on your outline, at the top of your outline, 1 Kings 9, 19 of verses one to five and then verse 10 it says this. So King Ahab told his wife Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he had ordered the death of all her false prophets of Baal. So the queen sent this threat to Elijah may my gods strike me dead if I don't kill you by this time tomorrow. Wow, it's a death threat from the queen. Elijah, it says, was afraid and he ran for his life. He left his servant in the town of Beersheba and he walked for a full day into the desert. Finally, he came to a broom tree and he collapsed under its shade. And then he prayed that he might die. He said, God, I've had enough. Take my life, just let me die, for I'm no better than my ancestors. And exhausted, he fell asleep under the broom tree. Later, down in verse 10, it says, Elijah told God, God, I have always worked hard for you, Lord, but your people have abandoned your covenant They've destroyed your places of worship and they've murdered all your true prophets and I'm the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. Uh, this guy's on the edge. He's empty emotionally. He's on the edge of burnout. Now, from this story, we can draw a lot of lessons uh, from what happened that deal with your life and my life today and how God turns setbacks into comebacks. This story, first of all, illustrates 10 signs of emotional burnout. 10 signs, they're all in Elijah's life. Uh, when your emotional tank is empty, you need to know these signs so you can respond. But more importantly, it teaches us how God refills your emotional tank when you're empty, okay? So let's get right into it. First, how do I know when my emotional tank is empty? Well, look at what Elijah says and look at what Elijah does. There are 10 things. They're all underlined in that passage there on your outline. Let's just go through them very quickly. First, I, I know I'm emotionally empty. My tank is empty. When that happens, number one, fear creeps into my life. You start becoming more fearful. The Bible says Elijah was afraid. When fear comes into your life, it's because your emotional tank is, is empty. Number two, I find myself running away from things when I'm running out of energy emotionally. The Bible says Elijah ran for his life. Question, what are you running from right now? What are you running from? It's a sign that you may be emotionally low on gas. Number three, 
I start backing out of relationships. Notice the third thing it says, he left his servant in the town of Beersheba. This is a guy had been with him for a long, long time and he's just walking away from him. Are you walking away from a relationship? That can, be drain, that can show that you're emotionally drained from all the stuff you're going through. Number four, you might write this down. I make foolish decisions impulsively. When I'm emotionally drained, I make foolish decisions impulsively. It says he walked for a full day into the desert. Okay, question, how smart's that? To walk for a full day in the desert. First, he's headed in the wrong direction. And second, he's got no plan. He's not taking water with him. He's walking in, in the wrong direction with no plan. That's a sign that you're on the edge of burnout, a sign that you're making foolish decisions impulsively. Number five, I push myself past my physical limits. Write that down. If you're doing that, you're headed for burnout. You push yourself past physical limits. I, I can get more done than I think it does. It says he collapsed under the shade of that broom tree, okay? He had just kept walking and walking into the desert until finally he just collapsed. Number six, when you're physically or spiritually or emotionally burned out, when you are on the edge of, of emotional emptiness, my work seems pointless. Notice the phrase there, he says, I've worked hard, but he says, I really haven't seen any results. I haven't seen anybody change. He says, nobody's making any change. The, the, the nation's still in a mess and they're still serving false gods and they're offering sacrifices to idols. And he blamed himself for things that weren't his fault. Now the nation's falling apart and he takes it personally. He goes, I'm a failure. You know, one of the great causes of burnout is trying to control everything, this Atlas syndrome. Friend, you can resign as general manager of the universe, it's not gonna fall apart because the whole world does not rest on your shoulders. There are a lot of things that are beyond your control and you're not responsible for other people's response in life. You know, as a pastor, I have to deal with this all the time. It's my responsibility to teach God's truth, but I'm not responsible for what you do with it. If I was, I'd worry myself to death, okay? He, he was just taking too much responsibility. Number seven, a seventh warning sign that your emotional tank is empty. I complain that I wanna quit and give up. That's what Elijah did. Notice he says, God, I have had enough. <laughs> He's like telling God, okay, I'm up to here. I'm at the end of my rope. I'm ready to throw in the towel. I'm, I'm ready to jump off the cliff. And, and when your emotional tank is low, you lose your vision, you forfeit your future, you forget your goals, you just wanna give up. You wanna stop caring. Elijah says, it's just not worth it. I'm ready to throw in the towel. Well, let me give you a couple more. Number eight, when your emotional tank is low, you feel isolated and attacked. I feel isolated, I feel lonely, I feel attacked. The, uh, notice the phrase Elijah says, I'm the only one left, okay? He's having a pity party. I'm the only one left and they're trying to kill me too. Now the truth is, Elijah's exaggerating the problem. We always do that when we're emotionally low. We make the problem worse than it really is. Because the truth is in Acts 19, excuse me, in 1 Kings 19 verse 18, look at this on the screen, God says this. Actually, Elijah, there are 7,000 other faithful souls in Israel who have not bowed down their knees to the false god of Baal. So you're not the only guy, you're not the only one. Quit having a pity party. There's 7,000 other people who've been faithful to me who haven't gone off the rails, who've been true to, to, to me. But Elijah is so drained emotionally, his view of reality is distorted. I mean, think about this. He's just had this enormous God contest where he wins against 450 false prophets in front of the entire nation. And now just one woman with an empty threat is a setback and he's running off to hide in a cave. Think about this. If Jezebel had actually intended to kill him, wouldn't she have sent a hit man instead of a messenger to warn him? Why do you send a messenger to warn a guy and say, I'm gonna kill you? Just send a guy and kill him. 
Why warn him so he can escape? So he's not thinking straight because he's emotionally drained. Number nine, the ninth sign that you are on the verge of burnout is I compare myself to others and I feel bad about me. Now, we've talked about this many times. The Bible says anytime you compare yourself to other people, it's foolish. The Bible tells us not to compare ourselves with others. And, and, and Elijah says, for I'm no better than my an ancestors. Uh, we depreciate our worth when we feel burned out. We, we put ourselves down mentally. We, the self-talk replays over and over in your mind. I'm nobody. My life doesn't matter. My, my work doesn't matter. My life has no value. Note the phrase, I'm no better than. That's a comparative phrase. One of the main causes of being emotionally drained is you start comparing yourself to other people. You compare everything. And then you start motivating yourself with criticism. I must, I should, I have to. And you become hypercritical and you become your own worst critic. And finally you feel guilty for not getting it all done and you just say it's hopeless. And friends, what I'm talking about right now is called emotional reasoning. It's focusing on your feelings instead of the facts. I feel it, so it must be true. You know, every pro athlete, every pro performer, speaker, musician, minister, they, they often get discouraged after great performance. After every mountaintop, there is a valley. You're emotionally depleted, so you can't think straight. And what you have to do is you have to learn to ignore your emotions, learn to ignore your feelings. I don't ever make any decision the day after Easter or Christmas because my feelings are highly unreliable. You know, I, I remember one time when Kay and I were on the honeymoon and I said, you know, I don't really feel married. <laughs> she said, well, it doesn't matter whether you feel it or not, Buster, you're married. Maybe you say, I don't feel God is with me. Well, feelings lie. That's emotional reasoning. Let me give you number 10, a 10th sign that your tank, your emotional tank is empty is what Elijah did. And that is, I think death might bring relief. Notice it says, Elijah prayed that he might die. And he says, take my life, Lord, just let me die. Now, let me just say to those of you who are listening right now, whether you're on the internet or on Daily Hope or in one of our campuses, maybe you felt that just dying would be the way to relief. And you think maybe taking my life would be the way to do that. Don't, don't. Taking your life is a permanent solution to a temporary mood. Don't. There are people who care, we care, we love you, and you need to get help, and don't. Never make a major decision when you're depressed. Now, of these 10 things, you look at that as a checklist, looking at that. Now do you realize why James tells us in James 5, 17, Elijah was a person just like us? Because you can identify with a lot of those 10 things. Now, that's good enough in itself, but this passage has even more to share with us, and it teaches us how God refills our emotional tank. And I want you to notice now the next three things that God does in spite of all the things that uh, 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 Elijah did when he ran out of gas emotionally. Okay, so let's look at these three things. Write these down. Number one, the first way God refills my tank is God makes me rest my body. God makes me rest my body. Psalm 23, two and three from the most famous Psalm in the Bible is this. He makes me lay down in great, lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores myself soul. Sometimes God has to make you lie down because you're not smart enough to do it yourself. He's going to force you to actually recharge your body physically, because you're physical. You can't be spiritually and emotionally uh, uh, strong while you're physically depleted. This is what happened to Elijah. First Kings 19, five to seven. It says, then Elijah laid down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. And he looked around and he saw some baked bread or on hot stones and a jar of water. So he's got some donuts. And so he ate and he drank and he laid down again and he went back to sleep. 
And it says, then the angel of the Lord came back to him again and touched him again and said, get up again and eat some more for there's a long journey ahead of you. So Elijah got up again and he ate and drank again and his strength was revived. You know what I love about God is how practical he is, that the antidote to, ju- uh, to Elijah's burnout was eat and sleep and eat and sleep. <laughs> God's first prescription was food and rest and relaxation. God did not scold Elijah. He didn't say, come on, man, you're having a pity party. He didn't give him a lecture. He just let him sleep. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is go back to bed. Take a nap. Psalm 127, verse 2 in the Living Bible says, God wants his loved ones to get their proper rest. As Vince Lombardi, the great football coach, you said, you know, fatigue makes cowards of all of us. It's amazing how different things look after good night's sleep. So the first thing God wants to do is if you're emotionally over the edge and you're drained and you're on the edge of burnout, he said, you need to take care of your body. Kay and I have a phrase at our house we call control the controllables. There are a lot of things you can't control, but you can't control what you eat, you can't control your sleep, you can't control what you do, and and some of those things in your schedule, control what you can control. God wants you, he makes you rest your body. That's the first thing. Some of you might need to go get a checkup with the doctor if you've been going through depression. It's not a sin to be sick. It's not a sin to be depressed. So go and maybe get a physical checkup and do whatever you need to do. Now here's the second thing God did. First he dealt with his physical needs. Eat, sleep, eat, sleep, eat, sleep. That's his first antidote to his, his uh, depression, his burnout, his, his empty tank, emotional tank. Second, God encourages me to release my frustrations. How many times have you heard me say this? Revealing your feeling is the beginning of healing. And we find that in the next few verses, 1 Kings 19, eight and nine. It says this, next, Elijah traveled 40 days to get to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. You know this mountain is where God gave Moses the 10 commandments, very famous mountain. And it says there, he, uh, Elijah, came to a cave where he spent the night. So he's he's run across the desert, he spent the night in a cave uh, in at Mount Sinai, but the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? And then Elijah said, and in the next few verses, Elijah just unloads his complaints and his frustrations. Now, you know, and I think even uh, uh, Sheila mentioned this last week, whenever God asks you a question, he already knows the answer. And when God says to Elijah, what are you doing here? God already knew why Elijah, he wanted Elijah to own up to why he was there. And Elijah's answer to that question, what are you doing here in a cave in Mount Sinai was to start complaining of all the things. And in in that, um, God says, I know Elijah, you're carrying a bundle of emotions. So he says, what's bugging you? Get it off your chest, it's okay, spill your guts. Uh, God is encouraging Elijah to blow off some steam and In that cave and in his prayer, Elijah vents his frustration. And he actually, if you go through this passage, uh, specifically deals with six emotions. Verse three, he vents his fear. Verse 10, he he vents his anger. Uh, Verse four, he vents uh, vents resentment. Uh, Verse 10, second part, loneliness, low self-esteem back up in verse four, worry in verse 10. Uh, He says, I'm afraid. I'm bitter, I'm angry, I'm lonely, I'm worried, I'm depressed. Here's the point, God isn't shocked when you can complain to him. He'll listen listen to you until you run out of words. Have you ever wondered why some of the Psalms are in the Bible? Because every emotion known to man is covered in the Psalms. In many Psalms, David is just unloading. It's kind of cathartic, he goes, God, right now life sucks. I don't like what's going on and I don't, and he just complains. You know what, God put those in the Bible for a reason, to show that it's okay for you to release your frustration. You gotta rest your body, that's the first step back to refilling your tank, rest your body, and you gotta release your frustration, that's the second step back to refilling your tank. So if you're feeling down, if you're feeling empty, 
you've had a setback and it's caused you to just lose the joy, lose the hope, lose the love, lose the enthusiasm in life, then you just need to tell God how you feel. First Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Just pour out your heart to Jesus. Uh, by the way, let me give you a little tip. It helps to share with friends and a small group or a counselor. Uh, that's why I always encourage everybody to get in a small group. You know, out on the patio at your campus, uh, there will be people out there who will help you learn to sign up to a small group if you're not. You know, when I'm out on the patio, when people share their hurts with me, and they go, they'll say, you know, Pastor Rick, I've never told this to anybody. Uh, first place I get excited because I know they're going to have some healing. But usually my first question is, are you in a small group? Because if you're in a small group, revealing your feeling is the beginning of healing. Now, there's a third thing that God does to help restore and refill our tank when we're empty after a setback. Okay, rest your body, okay? Rest your body and, and uh, release your frustrations. Then number three, God tells me to remember and refocus on him. I need to remember what he said. I remember who he is. I remember all his promises and I refocus on him. You get your eyes off your problem, off the troubles, off the trials, off the temptation and start looking at Jesus. You get a fresh awareness of God's power, and God's presence, and God's personality. This is the third step in Elijah's recovery, and it's found in the next couple of verses, 1 Kings 19, verses 11 to 13. Now, here's the instructions. The Lord said to Elijah, go stand in front of me in the mountain, and I will pass by you. And then a very strong wind blew past, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after that, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then there was a wildfire, but the Lord was not in the fire. But then there was a quiet, gentle sound, a whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he covered his face with his coat and he went out and he stood at the entrance to the cave. And the voice said, Elijah, why are you still here? <laughs> He's asking the same question again. God said, God says, I, I want you to get alone with me because I got something for you to see. And, and God puts on a multimedia event extravaganza for Elijah. First, a, her, a wind and hurricane and then an earthquake and then a firestorm and finally a small whisper. What in the world is God doing in all this? He's demonstrating his power. And the point is, Elijah, you're worried about one woman. I'm in control here. You can relax. You see, the root of a burnout, the root of being emotionally empty is you're trying to play God. You're trying to be God. You're trying to control everything, and you can't. You know, Frank Sinatra sang his famous song. It was actually the theme for his life. I did it my way. But you know what his last words were when he died? I'm losing it. Those were Frank Sinatra's last words. I'm losing it. Why? Because he wasn't in control of his life as much as he thought he was, and you aren't either. Let me share a, a, another verse from another guy who was emotionally empty. He was another prophet, and his name was Jeremiah. And one of the books that he wrote is called Lamentations, which means my complaints. And he writes it for posterity. He is releasing his frustrations to God, his lamentations. He's complaining to God. God, I don't like this. But Jeremiah finds the antidote to his emotional emptiness by remembering how good God is. And by doing this third step of refocusing and remembering, remembering what God is like and refocusing on what God has said and his promises. And, and in this verse that I want you to look at, and I, I, I want you to write this out on a card and put it in your, on your mirror or on your, your dashboard or on your, your refrigerator. He mentions five specific qualities that pull him out of his depression when his emotional tank is empty. It's Lamentation 3, 19 to 24. Now, let me read this to you, and I want you to just let this savor and simmer and soak in your mind. 
Jeremiah says this. He, remember, he's, he's down. He's, he's, he's empty. He says, just thinking of my troubles and my wanderings. What's wanderings? It means you're lost. You're, you don't know where you're going. You think, when I think of my troubles, when I think of, I haven't the slightest idea where I'm going in life. When I think of my troubles and my wanderings, it fills me with sadness and bitterness. He says, it's all I ever think about, and I'm depressed. But, and this is the big change here, then, but then I remember. This is step three, remember and refocus. But then I remember something that fills me with hope. Okay, you ready? I hope you're listening right now at every campus, listening online, because what I'm about to read to you from the Word of God will give you an amazing new shot of hope. He says, then I remember something that fills me, fills me with hope. And he says five things. Number one, the Lord's steadfast love never ends. His unfailing mercy keeps me from being wiped out. Number three, because of his great faithfulness, each new day, he is, number four, always kind to me. So deep in my heart, I say to myself, the Lord is all I need. He is my, number five, real hope. Those five things will pull you out of depression, out of burnout, will refill your tank if you will remember and refocus on those five qualities of God. You know, a lot of people like chocolate when they're depressed. A lot of people turn to sugar when they're depressed. Let's go get some ice cream. Let's go have some pie. And a lot of people turn to sugar as an antidote when they're emotionally empty, they want to fill up on sugar. Today, I want to give you a different kind of sugar to turn to when you're emotionally empty. So everybody get out a pencil and write this down. Here's Pastor Rick's, Rick's prescription. It's God's sugar pill for you. Remember these five things, S-U-G-A-R. Remember God's steadfast love. Write that down, that's the S. Remember God's unfailing mercy, that's the U. Remember God's great faithfulness, that's the G. Remember God is always kind, that's the A. Remember God gives real hope, that's the R, S-U-G-A-R, that's real sugar, steadfast love, unfailing mercy, great faithfulness, always kind, real hope. That'll give you a, a, a sugar high. It's a high that won't bring you down. It's the love of God. Build your life on those five qualities of God that Jeremiah depended on, that pulled him out of his sadness, his grief, his depression, his emptiness after his setback. Now finally, here's the last thing that God says to Elijah. 1 Kings 19, 15 and 16. He says to Elijah, Elijah, go back, go back, go back the way you came. He goes, go back the way you came to the desert of Damascus. And he says, when you get there, here's what I want you. I want you to anoint What's, what's anoint? It means I'm, you're going to appoint some other people to help you. I want you to anoint Haziel. I want you to anoint a guy named Jehu. And I want you to anoint a guy named Elisha. When, I want you to go back to where you came from. And when you get there, I want you to anoint Haziel and Jehu and Elisha. Now, what's going on here? God gave Elijah a brand new assignment. Why did God do this? Because God wasn't through with Elijah. And God isn't through with you. I don't know what setback you experience right now that's drained you, drained your emotional tank. You're running on empty. You're running on fumes. And you may be feeling burned out and out of gas. And I don't have anything to give. Well, God brought you here today. And God brought you here so you could hear these words. And so God could say this to you. Are you ready? God says, I'm not through with you. I'm not through with you. I'm not through with you. One of the quickest ways to defeat depression, get involved in helping somebody else. Jesus said in giving your life away, you find it. 
Elijah needed to get his eyes off himself, refocus on God's purpose and God's plan. You, ne you may be depressed, you may be burned out, you need to stay in love. You know, I, I, I need to go back and do what God wants me to do. And by the way, notice that in finding a place of service where you can give yourself away, that's a major part of seeing what God wants to do in your life. By, and, and that's a major part of joy returning in your life. And I'm sure that there are people here today who feel like Elijah did. Some days you don't wanna get out of bed. Some days you feel that everything's piling up against you. Some of you there are physically and emotionally exhausted. You may have a short fuse with other people. And no doubt some of you here today have even considered taking your life. Are you sick and tired of feeling sick and tired? There's hope in Jesus. He cares and we do too. So here's God's recovery plan to get well. You gotta deal with all these dimensions of your life, the physical and the spiritual and the emotional and relational. You gotta take care of your physical needs. Okay, rest, schedule change. You gotta face and deal with the emotions you're feeling and, and you need to release those frustrations. You gotta refocus and recenter your life around Christ and sugar, S-U-G-A-R, those five qualities of God. And you gotta get involved in helping somebody else. You know, many years ago, back in 1981, I went through an entire year of burnout. It took a full year for me to recover. You say, how did I recover? I followed these steps. And you will make it with God's help. Let me pray for you. Jesus, you know that many people are tired and you know that they're frazzled by their emotions and some of them are empty. And there are people here I know that this message has really spoken to them. And as we went down through that checklist, they were going, yep, that's me, yep, that's me, yes, that is me. Would you help them today as they turn to you? Would you restore their soul? Now you pray. Say, Jesus Christ, I wanna take these initial steps to refill my tank. Help me to rest my body. Help me to do whatever I need to do to, to to get in better shape, to, to take care of the physical parts of my body that I've been ignoring. I, I've been trying to burn the candle at both ends or whatever. And then say, Lord, I, I, I need to release. I need to release my frustrations. And just tell him what you're worried about. Tell him what you're bitter about. Tell him what you're sad about. Tell him what you're afraid of. Tell him what makes you angry. He can handle it. Release your frustrations. You may need to take some time off this afternoon or tomorrow or tonight or some other day and, and actually spend some time making a list of things you wanna share with God. And then finally, would you refocus and remember God's steadfast love and God's un failing mercy and God's great faithfulness. And remember, God is always, always kind. And remember that he is the source of real hope. That's real sugar. Father, I pray for everyone listening today, for those who've never opened their lives to Jesus Christ, may they do so right now. If you've never done so, say, Jesus Christ, come into my life and start changing me from the inside out. I wanna know you. I wanna learn to love you and trust you. I pray, Father, that you would bless each person in the sound of my voice, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thanks for checking out this message on YouTube. My name is Jay and I'm Saddleback's online pastor. I wanna invite you to take your next step by checking out our online community or help get you connected to a local Saddleback campus. Three things we have to offer you right now. First, learn more about belonging to a church family by taking Class 101. Second, don't live life alone and get into community with others by joining an online small group or a local home group in your area. Third, join our Facebook group to be more engaged with our online community throughout the week. Take your next step and learn where a local campus is near you by visiting saddleback.com online or email online at saddleback.com. Hope to hear from you soon.